All right. Well, welcome. Glad you could be here. I'm going to talk about Git today. Uh, more importantly, I'm going to cover basically three things about Git. The what, the why, and the how. So we'll cover each of those. So we'll be talking about Git. We'll also be talking a little bit about GitHub, because it seems these days that those two are kind of inseparable, especially in the open source and, especially, and specifically the PHP open source communities. So a little bit about me. My name's Jeremy. Uh, that beautiful woman dressed as Princess Peach next to me in that picture is my wife. I am a PHP engineer at Amazon Web Services and co-author of the AWS SDK for PHP, which is a lot of three-letter acronyms right there. But it's basically uh, the PHP library that you can use to interface with Amazon Web Services APIs. Uh, so I'm also the co-organizer of the Seattle PHP user group, and uh, I was on the Zend Education Advisory Board uh, this past year to help update their certification exam to PHP 5.5. I also uh, play keyboard and do vocals in a band local in Seattle called Gigawatt. And if you want to talk to me, you can get a hold of me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Jeremy Amaya uh, on Twitter and GitHub. So that's a little bit about me, but I also want to know a little bit about you guys. So I ask you to raise your hand a few times here if these things apply to you. So please raise your hand if you have used Git before. OK, so there seems like the majority of you are actually familiar, so that's cool. Uh, now keep your hand up if you have only used Git with a graphical user interface. You've never used the command line before. Ah, oh, see there? That's fine. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, and now raise your hand if you've used any other version control system like Subversion, CVS, Perforce, or anything else. OK. And raise your hand if you've never used a version control system. That's, oh. So cool. So that, that's, that's good. That, uh, there's a lot of people here familiar with version control, with Git. Good stuff. Now raise your hand if you have a GitHub account. Keep your hand up if you actually have repos that you've created on your GitHub account. OK, cool. And raise your hand if you came here to learn more about Git today. Cool. And uh, raise your hand if you only came to hear the song. Uh, good to know. <laughs> so we will get to the song uh, pretty soon here. I'm going to do a little bit of introduction with Git. Then we'll do the song. And then I'll get deep into like all the command line usage stuff. So if you came just to hear the song, I won't feel bad if you leave after the song. So if you walk out, that's OK. I will, yes. <laughs> so I, I said earlier we're going to cover the what, the why, and the how. So first, let's talk about what Git is. Uh, I, I would call it a version control system. I would say that it's really popular. It's distributed, it's fast, and it's free and open source software. So let's talk a little bit more about each of those. Uh, one, it's a version control system. Version control, also called source control, or revision control, is basically any practice that tracks and provides control over changes to source code. And that is a definition I stole from Wikipedia, but it made sense to me. It seems pretty good. A uh, version control system is a system that provides version control. Pretty straightforward there. Some of those are Git. Then there's also others, Subversion, CVS, Mercurial, Perforce, ClearCase, or Safe Bazaar, TFS. There are several other ones. Has anyone used one that's not on that list? What, what's that? Stash? OK. Darks? Oh, OK. I've never heard of that one. Uh, Mercurial is probably the most well-known other distributed version control system. Also, Bizarre up there is one. And there are definitely others, yeah. Uh, when you first use conversion control, uh, you kind of step into a new world with a bunch of new vocabulary words, things like repository, meaning the 
set of, of code and, and data about your code that's being tracked. You talk about revisions, versions, or, or commits, basically the same thing. Depends which version control system you're using is what kind of vocabulary you use. But those uh, revision is basically a tracked change to your repository. You have your working copy, which is what you are locally working on right now that you're making changes to. And then you refer to the most recent commit as the head or the tip of your repository. Then you have your main branch that you work on, your main development path. Uh, in Git, we call that the master branch, but in other version control systems, you might hear mainline or trunk. Uh, a branch would be a separate development path. So if you want to work on a feature, but you don't want to mess up what's on your main development path, you create a branch, and you do work there, and then you merge it in later. We're going to talk a little bit more about branching later. And then a tag is basically a name, or more often uh, a number that you assign to a particular commit that represents a stable or potentially stable release of your software. Uh, something cool about Git that's uh, at least different from some other version control systems is that Git uses snapshots and not deltas to track uh, differences between changes. So you can check out a commit by itself, and it has all the code that you actually need to from your repository. You don't have to check out the totality of all of the commits you've ever made to get all the deltas up to the point where you're at. You can just grab the single snapshot. But it does store it very smartly. So if there's uh, a block that's exactly the same as in the previous commit, instead of copying that block, it just creates a pointer back to that other block so that it stores it as, as efficiently as possible. OK, so the other th another thing about Git is that it's very popular. Uh, if it wasn't popular, we probably wouldn't be having a talk about it. So that's, you know, that's one thing. Uh, who is using? But who is? Who out there is using Git? Uh, on the Git website, they have the logos of several companies uh, that are that are all saying that they're using Git. People like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and then a bunch of other projects out there like Linux, Ruby on Rails. Uh, and uh, I work at Amazon Web Services, so I can tell you that we also use Git. If you're interested in any of the open source projects that we work on, you can go to github.com slash AWS. It has our uh, projects that we work on externally. Uh, but specific to the PHP community, really almost every project out there is using Git. That includes all of the big frameworks like Zen, Symfony, Laravel, Cake, Codeigniter, uh, all the uh, popular libraries like Doctrine, tools like Composer, uh, pretty much everything out there. Like I, I was having trouble <coughs> finding one that didn't use Git in some form. And not everyone is using Git on GitHub, but they are using, like Drupal uses Git uh, in a private, in their own host repository. It's still Git. Um, so uh, one thing that's that's different about Git than say Subversion, uh, which who, who's used Subversion before? Who's familiar with that? Okay, I figured that would probably be the second most uh, known. Uh, it's but Git is distributed, whereas Subversion is centralized. So when we talk about the difference between those two. In a centralized system, you basically have a server that contains the canonical repository that you're working on. And when you want to make changes to your code, you check out the repository, you make changes, then you commit those changes back. And if you are offline, you cannot even access that repository. It's not available, because you have to work with that centralized server. In a distributed environment, you can have multiple nodes in the system. Uh, you typically will pr uh, designate a server as being your canonical repository, but you really don't even have to. Because every single node in the system, I'll have a complete copy of the repository. I think in most cases, we probably would consider, uh, for several of the projects out there, GitHub as being our canonical repository. And then you, you check out your, your code from GitHub, work on it, and, and uh, commit it back. But so the cool thing about distributed uh, version control, at least to me, is that I can be on the bus with no internet connection. 
I can work on my code, I can make changes, I can track them all locally without needing a connection to the internet at all. And then later on, I can sync that with the other repositories later. So that's one cool thing about Git and about distributed version control uh, in general. Another thing about Git that I, that I noticed the first time I used it, coming from using mostly Subversion before, is that it just feels really, really fast. Everything you're doing just feels so much faster than Subversion, whether it's checking out a repository, creating a branch, making a commit. Part of that is because of its distributed nature, that lo a lot of those operations that you're doing happen completely local to your system. No need for a network connection. So that definitely speeds it up. I don't know what other kind of black magic actually happens within Git. I'm not an expert in Git internals, but uh, it just seems really fast every, for everything that I do. Uh, and then finally, uh, Git is free and open source software. So yeah, I heard that as well, that, that Subversion has recently changed to adopt more of that model where it's just in the root of your repository. But definitely a few years ago when I switched from Subversion to Git, I also noticed that it's really nice to only have that Git folder with the metadata in the root instead of every folder because I can't even count how many times I accidentally you know, RMRF the directory and lost the Subversion data with that. So um, I'm glad to see that Subversion adopted that model. Uh, but yeah, that, that was one cool thing I noticed when I did switch to Git as well. <laughs> okay, so we covered the what. Let's talk about the why. Why should you use Git? Boiled it down to a few points, some which are, are kind of already apparent from talking about what Git is. Um, I said one of the main reasons that you need to learn and understand Git is to continue to be employable. Uh, really, we, we looked at all those companies using Git, all those projects using Git. If everyone's using Git, it makes sense that we probably should know how to use Git so that we can work for those companies and work on those projects. Uh, along with that, the, we talking about those projects. To, to really be a good contributor, contributor to open source software, you need to learn Git. And you probably will have projects on, on GitHub as well. So if you, if you haven't signed up for GitHub, you probably should. Because learning Git means that you can then put code on your GitHub profile. And uh, who, who here is in charge of interviewing or hiring in any kind of capacity within their company? OK. So do you, when you in, like read a candidate's resume, do you ever go and look at their GitHub profile if they provide it? I know that's, that's usually one of the first things that I do is like, I'll get the resume. I only may only read half the resume before I find the GitHub link and go to their GitHub profile. <laughs> Yeah. And so having a GitHub profile not only uh, is good when people already have your resume, but it can kind of act as a resume uh, because people will, you know, lurk on GitHub and try to find people that have good profiles to invite in for interviews. So it's a very good tool to help you advance in your career as well as, get, you know, just get the jobs that you want. How many of you deploy your code to the cloud or, you, or using any kind of platform as a service solution out there? So raise your hands a little bit higher because you know if I take my glasses off, I won't be able to see you. So, okay. So if you uh, if, if messed around or are using any type of platform as a uh, platform as a blah blah blah, blah. pass <laughs> platform as a solution. Then, uh, like Elastic Beanstalk, Heroku, uh, formerly PHP Fog, Gapbog stuff, 
uh, Fort Rabbit, what are some other ones? Open Shift, Engine Yard, there's a lot of them. Most of them have a deployment mechanism that interacts directly with Git. So you can push your repository to their service and then they take care of the deployment for you, or you can point them to a remote Git repository and they'll pull it in and deploy it for you. So knowing Git actually helps you do better deployments in some cases. If you use Composer, uh, Composer is tied to Git and GitHub and things like that. Knowing Git can help you use Composer better, or at least help you understand what it's doing. And if you're, you're frankly just you know, tired of using your current uh, version control system, you might want to learn Git so you can move on. OK, so we talked about the what's the whys. Now we're at the hows. So today what I want to do is go over what I consider the 20 essential commands to Git. Uh, both. And it, uh, actually, I think tomorrow Elizabeth is giving a talk about GitHub. Uh, is it tomorrow morning or afternoon? OK. So if you want to learn more about like how to use GitHub or why you want to use GitHub, that would be a great talk to go to. Uh, OK. So I want to talk about 20 essential commands. But instead of just telling you about these commands, I really wanted to help you, give you a good way to remember them. So I wrote a song called You're Doing Git. And if you, uh, I'm going to pull, show, show the lyrics while I'm singing it. But all these 20 commands are in the song, plus a few extra ones, too. Uh, I originally was trying to get a keyboard here so I could play and sing at the same time. Uh, it ended up not panning out, but I have a recording a little bit <laughs> of the song. and. Uh, Unfortunately, my voice is also on the recording, so I'm going to be singing kind of over the top of myself, but it should work out fine, right? Sure. <laughs> well, to take my words out of context, yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think we're ready for the song now. You got it ready to go? Let's do this. Get help config and in it. Remote fetch pull, let's edit. Diff add status commit. You're doing git. Log branch checkout, that's it. Checkout merge rebase, don't quit. Clean reset tag, push those bits. You're doing git. You're doing git. Fork and clone all the repos you know. Patches and pull requests, you'll steal the git show. You're doing git. You're doing git. You're doing it. Check it to blame and see your username. Hope you ran the test before your commit, or other devs will think you're an idiot. You're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> so I do have the lyrics here on the slides. I forgot to change the slide, but they'll be on my slides, posted on, joined in. OK, so like I said, if you came just for the song, you can go ahead and leave. But <laughs> um, What I want to do now is kind of go through uh, how you use Git. I'm going to show you some, uh, instead of doing live coding, which I'm really bad at, I actually did it all in advance and have the, the inputs and outputs to show you what commands you need to put in, what the results look like. We kind of go through a workflow 
of how you create repositories, how you make changes, how you sync up with your remote repositories. Uh, so we're just going to go through uh, there. And, and if at any point you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me and we can discuss it further. So first on the list there is git help command. Git help is your friend, especially when you're new to git, because you can type it git help in the name of a command, and it tells you how to use it. That's perfect. That's what, exactly what we need. Uh, if you type git help by itself, it gives you back the general format of the help. It gives you a list of the commands that are available. Uh, then if you type git help in the name of the command, like in this case, we're doing git help init, then it will spit out a man page uh, basically showing you everything about the, that command. Uh, second, the first time you use git, and, and well, I mean, not just the first time, but uh, git config is used to configure git. Uh, sp specifically, the first time you use git, you're going to want to set up your username and your email so that when you create commits, your, your information is actually attached to the commit as the author. Uh, so to do that, you can use git config dash dash global, which is going to edit your global git configuration. You also have configuration specific to your repository. So if you leave out the global flag, it'll just apply to the repository that you're in. Git config global user.name, git config global user.email, you can set those. To see what you have in your configuration, you can just type git config and then the name of that parameter without setting a value, and it'll spit that back out to you, show you what you have. OK, uh, to create a repository, use the git init command. Uh, on here on this uh, little snippet, I have, uh, I'm creating a directory, going into that directory, and then typing git init. And basically, all that does, all it seems to do, is it creates a single .git folder. And that's that. There's, no, no, there's not very much ceremony around it. It just appears, and you're done. So if you do uh, ls afterwards, uh, it'll show that uh, .git folder. If you want to look into that git folder, you'll see that there's a lot of things in there. Uh, head, config, hooks, objects, branches. I'm not going to talk about what that stuff is. That's way beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But that's going to hold all the information about your repository. So if you delete that folder, your git repository is gone. Your code is still there, your files, but all the information about tracking is, is now gone. So don't delete that unless you mean it. Uh, yeah, that's to show everything, including like hidden files, because that .git folder won't show up normally. Uh, another command, git status. This is probably going to be your best friend. I think I've typed this command more, like by far, more than any other git command. Uh, it, it gives you the status of your git repository, very reasonably named. Uh, if you do it in your empty repository, it's going to say something like on branch master. It's say initial commit because you haven't done anything yet. And then if you haven't made any changes, it'll tell you you have nothing to commit. The great thing about the status command is that it tells you what you need to do next. So this says nothing to commit, create and copy files and use git add to track them. So that's what we're going to do next. So uh, when you make changes in Git, you have a little bit of a workflow. Uh, you, there's, I separated these into kind of the state of your repository into three things. So you have the working copy, which is what you're doing. The staging area, which is, uh, I don't know if it's unique to Git, but it's, I mean, if coming from a subversion background, like the staging area was not a thing at all. So when you start using Git, you're there, you have the staging area. Then you have the, the local repository, which is all the information that's tracked in that uh, .git folder. So uh, when you are working on your repository, you're working on that working copy. If you change a file, then you add it to the staging area. And then once you have your staging area ready to go, you commit that. So you can make changes, but you only have to stage the things that you actually want to change. And then you can commit those, still leaving other changes that you, that you want to do later. You don't have to commit everything at once. That, that staging area really helps you prepare your, your commit. So let's take a look at how this is actually done. 
Um, so we have our empty folder. We're going to add an index.php file, nice little hello, hello world there, and then a readme file because any project that you push to GitHub should have a readme. Then I'll type git status, which this will show us a, something a little bit different now because we have files in there. It says we have untracked files. And then, it, like I said, it tells you what to do next. It says use git add and the file name to include. And then it'll show you what files are in there. If they're red, that means they've changed but are not staged yet. So it told us to use git add, so let's do that. I'm going to do each file separately, git add index.php, git add readme. Then if I do git status again, we'll see that the status of our repo has changed. And now it has the files in green, meaning those are in our staging area, and that they're, those are staged to be committed. Now this says that we can use git rm cached file to unstage. So let's talk about that. Let's say I, I put the index and the readme in my staging area, but I'm like, I don't want to commit the readme yet because I didn't really put anything in there. It's not ready. So I can type git rm cached readme. If I do git status again, it now shows uh, index PHP as you know being staged. It's green, and then readme as untracked. So that's so if I were to do if I were to commit this right now, only the index.php would be a part of the commit. The readme would not because it's not staged. But I want to go ahead and commit that readme. So if I type git add dot that actually is a command to put everything into the staging area. So that's one you have to be careful with. Like it literally put everything in your staging area even if you didn't want it to be. So it's sometimes it's better if you're making small changes to call out the file explicitly with git add and the file name. But if you've only made like a handful of things changes and you know that they're all going in there, then you can do git add dot as a shortcut. Just yes. I think so. Yeah. I don't remember it not being. Okay. Um, then to do a commit, you use the git commit command. Uh, and what you should do on every commit is make sure to add a message. So dash m, and then in quotations, the message for the commit. That message should describe briefly what you did in that commit. So if you look at your, your history of commits later on, you actually know why you committed files there. And so everyone else on your team can know too. Then that'll spit out some information about what files changed. It says here on this slide, eight insertions, zero deletions. Those insertions are uh, new row, like new lines, and deletions are you know zero lines removed. So uh, that kind of helps you see, gives you a, like an eyeball glance of like how much code you actually changed, aside from just what files were changed. If you do git status after a commit, it says you're on branch master, but you have nothing commit. Your working directory is clean. So everything that we had that we changed is now committed. Uh, git diff is a cool command. It allows you to, to compare your working copy to the most recent commit. Or you can use other parameters to compare other things. But just by itself, if I were to uh, make another change to the readme document, and then type git diff, it would show me a cool little diff with red and green saying, hey, this is what it used to be, this is what it is now, and it'll show you that for all the files that you changed so you can quickly see what you've already done before you start staging and committing things. Then uh, another command you can use to revert changes. So we talked about using git rm cached to unstage things, but if you just want to flat out like get rid of the changes that you made and revert back to your most recent commit, you can use the get reset command, get reset dash dash hard. And that will revert everything that you've done. So if, if you only want to revert like one file, uh, if you see, if you look at the output of get status here, it actually tells you again, get status is our friend because it tells us what to do. It tells us use get checkout dash dash and the file name to discard changes to just that file. So you can use that to discard changes to a single file or git reset dash dash hard to revert all the changes. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, so this is before you do the add. Uh, I think it's still, like, git reset dash dash hard will even, like, clear out things that you've already staged. Uh, but if you're just looking to do single files, you want to do, like, git remove cache to unstage it, and get check out dash dash file. Actually, I think it, it, it doesn't matter if it's in the staging area, now that I think about it. So if, if you made changes to it, you can get rid of them whether or not you've already staged it. Uh, the git log command uh, lists out commits and messages. You can change the format of this. This is like a very basic uh, log format. But this is you know, where your commit messages are really helpful, because this will kind of tell the story of your repository. Yeah, good point. So that's that's reverting to the most recent change on your local repository. So you can use other flags and parameters if you want to revert to the most recent change on the remote repository. So good point. Yes. Yeah, it'd be similar. I can't remember. Is anyone could anyone help me out with that one? So I think he's asking, so if, if I do git add on a file that's been changed to my staging area, then I make more changes. Do I need to do another git add? OK. So it stages just what you changed at that time. Yeah. 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 The, the only thing I would be careful about there is that it's hard to then you revert one of those changes without reverting the other. So once you get to the point where you can commit, you should, and then like that's a different task. So if, like if you finish one task, commit that, and then start the, a new task, or do it on a different branch. So I, 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 don't, I haven't heard of people normally doing it like that, uh, just because I think maybe later on you might change more files than you think you needed to begin to begin with. So.
And uh, you can actually also, with different parameters, you can, you can stage only parts of a file. So like if you made a bunch of changes in a file, and you're like, oh, but I only want these lines to be included in the next commit, you can actually stage just that part. So you can do cool stuff like that, too. Yeah, if, if you've already added it. So you, you can edit. I, I typically just edit, and then when I'm ready, then I add it and commit it. But if you edit, then add, and then you're like, oh, I want to do some more editing, then you need to add again, because you haven't staged those new changes that you made. OK, so we were talking about uh, git log. There wasn't really much more to say about git log. It just shows you what you did. Uh, so with those first 10 commands, everything that we did there was local to our machine. It was all in our local repository. We didn't do anything over the network or over the internet at all. So we cover the first 10, look at the next 10, and these are where we start interacting with the, you know, our remote repositories. So there is a command called git remote. And this is how you hook up your local repository to a remote one, whether it's your one that you've designated as your canonical source or just another one. Like you can actually set up Git to do like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, synchronization that way. I won't go into that because there's a couple other things you have to do to make that work right. But um, with uh, with remote, you Git remote has a subset of commands. So we're just talking about Git remote add here. Uh, to add a remote, you take git remote add, and then you give it a name. You name your remote, and then you give it the the path, the URL. Now, for what the repos the re remote repository that you're treating as your canonical repository, it's uh, best practice to git to name that as origin. So, whenever like if you are if your main repository is in GitHub, that would be what you would name as your uh, origin uh, re repository. You can name whatever you want. You can name it cheese or poo, whatever you want to do. <laughs> uh, to see the see what remotes you have added, because you can add more than one, uh, you can do git remote dash dash verbose. That will give you a list of the current remotes you have set up with your repository. So if we look back at our workflow diagram here, I'm gonna I added the remote repository, and we're gonna talk about the commands that we use to sync down from our remote and then sync back to our remote. Basically, if you're starting from a remote repository, you have to use either the pull or fetch command to bring that into your local, and then either check out or merge to, to declare what you're working on in your working copy, and then our add and commit process that we talked about, and we use the push command to sync it back to our remote. Let's talk about git push first, since we've we, uh, the first 10 commands we there, we talked about you know, that adding that index and readme file. We create a repository. That's ready to go. Let's say we, want, we added a remote. Let's just go ahead and push that code. We, we would do push, git push, origin master. So you have to tell the name of the remote. So we're using our origin remote. And then the name of the branch, which if you only have one branch, that's uh, going to be master unless you've created a different one and deleted your master branch. Uh, so git push origin master, it tells us what happened there, tells us uh, where we pushed it to, uh, what the ID of that the commit has been updated to, and then which branch from our local went to which branch on our master. Because you could push a branch that's of a certain name on your local repository to a branch that's named differently on your remote. Uh, git will let you do that. Most of the time, that doesn't make sense because that makes it really hard for you to personally keep track of what you're doing. So I don't recommend doing that, <laughs> but you can. So if we wanted to, instead of starting from scratch like we did with git init, we created our own directory and typed git init and create a repository. Instead of starting from scratch, let's say we wanted to start from the source that's already in our remote repository. So I, let's. You know, change directory back out. We'll delete our one that we created, and then we're going to use the git clone command. So git clone, and you give it the, the URL that clones the repository and creates the copy of the repository on your local machine. 
and it, it creates that folder for you named after the repository. You can also uh, optionally specify uh, a different name folder if you want to call that directory something else. Uh, yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about the actual pull and fetch commands, though, related to that. Uh, just a second. So uh, then, after create, doing the clone, we'll change directory into there, and then um, I can talk about the pull and fetch right now. So if we the to sync down from a repository, hold on one second. Sync down from a, repos from a repository, use the pull command, and just like we do with push, we have to tell it the name of the remote and the mass and which branch we're using. So in this case, we just cloned the repository. So if we do a pull, that actually is kind of a no-op because we're already synced up. But if we run the command, it'll tell us, hey, we, you know, your master branch, we fetched the head, and it doesn't really do anything because it says you're up to date. Uh, you had a question? So what's the difference between a checkout and a checkout, we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, that's related more to branching and stuff. Okay. So. Clone is how you get the whole source from a remote to your local. So along with git pull, there's also a command called git fetch. They're related, but slightly different. If when you do git fetch, uh, and then you tell it the name of the remote, it'll get all the information about that remote repository, all the meta information, and sync that up with your local repository. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't alter what you're working on at all. So if you have a bunch of changes, you do git fetch origin, it'll be basically like nothing happened, because all it did was sync the metadata. Uh, the difference between pull and fetch is that pull does the fetch, but then it also does a merge. So if you if you are working on things and you do a git pull, you're, you're likely to possibly get con conflicts when you do that, because you're saying, go ahead and get what's there and merge it onto what I'm doing right now. But if you're already doing something else, that may not be what you actually want to do. Instead, we want to use git fetch. So uh, you want to pay attention to kind of the state of your repository when you're choosing whether you want to just fetch and sync the data, or pull, which is syncing the data, and then actually merging what's in the remote branch onto what you're doing. So if you've just like, if you have a clean working directory, you've just made a commit or something, in that case, it's usually safe to pull. But if you're working on stuff and you have changes, I would probably do fetch and then decide if you want to uh, merge those changes or not. Oh, sorry. Uh, like, uh, it's going to just merge whatever, like, if you do a pull, it would just merge whatever is the most recent commit in the remote repository. It'll merge it onto what you're doing. Uh, if there was a commit from someone else that changed a file that you're working on right now, it could collide with what you're doing. So, like they could have changed something that you're actually changing. With fetch, it doesn't actually change your code. It just updates your local repository's information about what has been done on the remote. So you, your local copy will know that there is a new commit that you don't have, but you don't. You have the choice of whether or not you want to merge that in now or later, like after you have cleaned everything up with what you're doing. All right, let's talk about branching a little bit. So I think one of the cool, the, my favorite things about Git is how easy it is to do branching, how fast it is. When I was working on Subversion, I don't think I ever used branches because they were a huge pain. Uh, like we had a really big code base, so if you created a branch, it'd take like 20 minutes to just create the branch. I don't want to wait for that. When you do git, type git branch and, and git and create a branch, it's instant because it is no, nothing over the network. You're just creating a branch locally, and it's basically just changing a pointer, just saying, hey, this is the branch you're working on now. If you already have changes, those changes, it, like it doesn't care. It just says you're on this branch, so the next time you do a commit, whatever changes you were working on will just be in that new branch instead of where you were before. So branching is basically, you know, just it follows a lifeline. If you if you're on the master branch, you create a new branch called in. In this case, we're going to do one called Improve Readme. It creates this new branch, but the uh, the 
the master branch continues to exist, you're just not doing anything with that right now. So if we type git branch improve readme, then that'll create our branch, but we don't switch to it yet. It just creates it. If we type git branch without any name, that it'll list out the branches that you have. So it'll show that, yeah, we created this branch, but the master, which has a star next to it, that's the branch you're still on. To change branches is where we use the git checkout command. So if you type git checkout improve readme, then it'll change you over to that branch. If you list your branches again, you'll see that, hey, now this star is on improve readme. So any commits that you make while you're on this branch will belong only to this branch. Once you've made changes, you make commits to a branch, at some point, theoretically, you plan to merge that back in to your master branch. Typically, what people do is they'll keep their master branch as representing what's in the, your, your production level code. And you'll do features or other things, bug fixes in separate branches. So your, your other branch is free to change. Like if you have some kind of emergency, you can switch back to your master branch, make changes there, then switch back over to your branch that you're working on to continue working on your feature without any kind of disruption or having to do weird merges from one to the other. They're, they're independent of each other. Uh, when you want to merge back in, you use the merge command. So let's say I you know, edited the readme, I added it, committed it, and said I improved the readme. I now have this new commit on my improved readme branch. To, to merge it in, you check out the branch that you're merging to, merging back to. So I'm going to check out my master branch. And then I say git merge, the name of the branch. And then it takes those commits and then applies them to the, the branch that I'm merging to. And that, that will give you a summary of, of all the changes that happened. So you, if you've done like 20 commits, you might have a longer summary there that dumps out saying, hey, these are all the files that changed as a result of the merge. There's another command called git tag. And this is used when you want to basically give a name to a particular commit. And you would want to do that in situations like if you're releasing your software, you know, you'd tag it at a particular version. Version 1.0 or 2.03, you create a tag and name it that. And that you know, signifies that release. In and of itself, it doesn't really do much. But we're in conjunction with other tools that, that look specifically at tags, that's where you know, it's only looking at the tags. Like Composer, for example, uh, it, it picks up those tags and knows what version of, the, of your code to download when someone installs your library. Uh, then your t tagging is also a local operation. So if you want to push your tag up, up to a remote or another machine, the need to use the git push command, but you need to use the dash dash tags uh, parameter. So if you do, and now that we've created the tag, if we do git push dash dash tags origin master, then it'll also push any commits that we haven't pushed yet, but also any tags we haven't pushed yet too. So it'll sync everything up to the remote. That's all 20 of the commands right there. Woo! Congratulations! <laughs> There is also a pat on the back there. That's a lot of information to cram inside your brain. Uh, just to summarize the commands there, I kind of split them up into different groups. So for starting a repository, init, clone, config. For changing, making changes, you use add, commit, reset, remove. For checking the status, status, diff, log, and, and so on, so on. These are kind of how, you, how I logically separate them anyway. I don't know if that's helpful to you or not, but that's just how I think of them. Uh, so I have a few more minutes here. I wanted to talk about some of the tools that are available in the Git ecosystem, as well as some workflows, common workflows that people use. I don't have a whole lot of time to spend on it, but I did want to cover at least so you know the names of things so you can go look it up later and, and mess around things on your own. Uh, so if you want to do uh, Git hosting, there are a lot of uh, third-party solutions. The most well-known, of course, is GitHub. Uh, but also, there's uh, Bitbucket. There's a lot of like SourceForge, which has been around forever, but they, they now have Git support. Uh, Gitorious, Google Code, which is, is that a thing anymore? Is that Google Code? 
Are they? Is it still going? I thought they were closing that or something. I don't know. Maybe that was Google Reader. I don't know. <laughs> uh, CodePlex is the Microsoft uh, version control stuff. Uh, then, but you can also host your own Git repository. You don't have to rely on a third party. Just like you host your own website, you can host your own Git repository. Uh, you really don't actually need any extra tools. Git itself can be used to set up your Git hosting. Uh, there are other tools out there. Two of the ones that I'm aware of are Gitolite, which I have no idea if that's how you actually pronounce that. I usually call it Gitolite, but I don't think anyone <laughs> really calls it that. Uh, Gitosis is another one. Those uh, provide you know extra helpers for managing that and provide a graphical interface, stuff like that. GitLab, okay. Okay. Awesome, okay. GitLab then, that is another one. I'll have to look that one up and put it on my slides. Thanks. Um, then there are also, as far as your Git clients, you have the command line, which we talked about, in which you do need to learn, because it's very important that you understand how to use the command line. But there are also tons of graphical interfaces for Git. Uh, Git actually comes with one called Git GUI. That's a screenshot of it. It's pretty awful. It's, it's really ugly. But it gets the job done if that's all you have. Um, GitHub, the web interface, is an option. But they also have Mac and Windows clients that are really cool. Uh, Tower is a really popular one. Does anyone here use Tower? OK, so a few hands. Uh, that one is not free. But it is, uh, from what I've heard, very good. Uh, I don't, <laughs> All right. So yeah, if you don't care what's going on, then Tower is a good thing to use. <laughs> just, just make my code work. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'd say some of the like, like some of the really good features, some of the graphical interfaces out there are like, um, like more powerful diffing things that are make it a lot easier to either merge things, resolve conflicts, or just see the differences between things. Uh, I know that um, like I, I use PHP Storm for my developments, and it actually has a, a pretty decent set of uh, Git tools and, and version control tools in general built into it. Um, so I use like the diffing stuff in PHP Storm. Uh, plus, they have terminal support in PHP Storm now too, so you can just type your Git commands in without leaving your IDE. And I know a lot of other IDEs have similar features. Okay, Mar Mark's smart Git. Oh, okay, that's one I'll have to check out too. Thanks. Magix, maggot, like the early fly form. Okay. <laughs> A couple of things about workflows. A little short on time, so I don't have too much time to dive into it. Um, Everyone has their own Git workflow, and that is totally fine. Because a lot of the time, the way that you manage your branches and the way you do things is going to be dependent on what what you're working on. And especially, I like if you're working on a library versus an application, I think you'll find that it, you'll do a completely different type of workflow. Uh, whatever makes sense to you and your team is is what will work. Uh, if you're interested, if you like, you have no idea what you should be doing, then two that you should check out first. Uh, is Git flow, and, and then there's there's also a, a GitHub flow, which they published on their blog. So I have links to those you can check out. Uh, the Git flow article has a cool diagram that looks initially very complicated, but if you read the article, it makes a lot of sense. Um, when at my last job, uh, we did a lot of application development, and this actually fits what we were doing really well. Uh, then when I moved to AWS and started working on the SDK, it did not fit that at all, not in any way. Um, and we used something more similar to what the GitHub flow looks like. Uh, an interesting thing about Git, working with Git, is that you can have multiple remotes. So uh, working on the AWS SDK for PHP, we actually have our public GitHub repository. <coughs> where all of our public code lives, and we push things there. That's the canonical resource. 
But we also have a privately hosted Git instance where we work on features that haven't been announced yet. We write the code for them, we put them there. So we, we push to either GitHub or, or we push to our private one, and eventually the stuff that's in our private one gets merged in and then pushed out to GitHub as well. So you can have those kinds of uh, workflows with multiple remotes. Well, it's from your local. So you can do, if, like, when you, it, like, if you get, if I have origin as my GitHub repository, then if I called, like, you know, Amazon as my named remote for the other one, I can do git push origin master and git push Amazon master. I can push to either one. So I keep all of that locally in different branches. And then when the things that are on private, like private features will be on a different branch, they'll merge that into master and then push that to GitHub. So it's like you don't really go from one to the other. You just keep track of it all locally. And then you push different, thing, different branches to different remotes. I'll talk to you more about it afterwards, because I don't have, we're pretty much here on end on time here. Uh, this is uh, kind of related to that, but like I said, I don't have time. Um, GitHub is pretty awesome. I think it's really the main reason that Git has caught on and become so popular. Uh, and they've just kind of grown, to, grown up together. Very cool set of tools. Uh, it's a great web interface. It's you know it's encouraged collaboration. Uh, I mean I, I think you've seen the changes in the past five years of how people in the PHP community have collaborated uh, on projects, and it's really because of Git and GitHub that this in, this collaboration has grown. It has other features like issue trackers and milestone trackers built in, wikis, project pages, uh, or teams and organization management. Uh, comments, code reviews. Two coolest things are probably forking and pull requests, though. So you can fork a, one someone else's repository to your own account and then treat it like that's your own thing. And then, as you would make changes to that, you can send them a pull request says, hey, I made these changes. And then it shows up on their account, lets them review them, and say, yes, I'll take those, merge those. So you can that's how you do a merge from one fork to another. So it's kind of built a cool ecosystem where we can help each other out with our various projects. So that's Git. We talked about what, why, and how. Git is a fast, distributed, fun, popular, and free version control system. If you want to keep getting jobs, if you want to contribute to open source, you need to learn Git. And there's tons of tools. There's the CLI that you need to learn. And uh, I have, I said, go create lots of branches. What I mean by that is, you know, go and, and play with Git, work on projects. Uh, the only, the best way to learn Git is to just keep doing it. Uh, so with that, that's about all I got. Thanks. <laughs>